12, 2018. Motion approved. Second. So motion by Ingleberger, second by Hannah. Would anyone wish to change or amend the minutes? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Council representative report. Alderperson Ingleberger. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we've got uh, several items that were approved since our last meeting. Um, Ordinance 8, 2018, which was an amending zoning for the City of Stoughton Public Works Facility. Uh, res resolution 36, which was a certified survey map of, uh, for the uh, Public Works Facility. Uh, resolution 37, which was a conditional use permit for the City of Stoughton Public Works Facility. Um, resolution 38, which was an extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, land division request at 731 Bass Lake Road. Uh, resolution 39, which was an amendment to the uh, amendment to the planning department fee schedule, effective March 1st of 2018. And there was a couple other ones. Uh, Ordinance 3, 2018, approving a general development plan for 565 Kensington Square for a deck. And Ordinance 4, uh, amending zoning classification for the uh, uh, property at 1035 Sunt Lane, which went from neighborhood uh, business to uh, single family residential. That was it. Great. Thanks, lots Michael. Lots of stuff. There's lots of stuff going on. It's, it's spring, right? Yep. And status of our current developments. Planning Director Shield. In your packet is uh, the customary list of things that are going on, but there's one I think is worth highlighting. And it's really one that we've been getting a lot of discussion on at the office. Um, the Eggleson's Woods area that people are, are hearing about or understanding the change that's taken place out there. I just wanted to graphically show you on a map um, the properties that uh, the large parcels of land. Here's 51. Um, this is the, the roadway into Eggleson's Woods. Eggleson's Woods is the platted lots where the residential units are built. The parcel on the west side of 51 as, we as well as this large parcel and this large parcel um, were, trans um, were purchased by a developer and they're currently not in the city limits so all of the excavation and clearing and stuff that's occurred in these three larger parcels um, is not something that the city has input on certainly our comprehensive plan anticipates this area for development and if there is any development proposals will have to come through this the system and go through an annexation process but um, a lot of questions are, are surrounding that but suffice it to say it's not in our jurisdiction at this point. But to be used agriculturally is what we understand at this time anyway. Yeah, I think it's zoned ag exclusive under the county zoning, so I think that's still uh, a permitted use of that property. Sure. I, I'm not an arborist, uh, don't claim to be a forester, um, but certainly there's, there seems to have been a variety of, of trees at different levels of maturity and different species. So. Um, some of it might have just been undergrowth that had, had grown up, but, th but there were certainly some areas that had fairly sizable stands of trees. Thank you. Commissioner Hanna. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the, <coughs> the development report here says there's a piece of property that the city owns. Can you point that out? Well, that, not that the city owns. Um, is within the city limits, oh, I think? Sorry, yeah. Yep. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a strip along here that was annexed as part of the uh, Leonard annexation, I, they actually, I believe it's this. The skinny part? I believe it's the skinny part um, because when Walmart and this development was maybe going to occur up there, there needed to be um, appropriate access at this intersection and they needed a strip of land for that to be accomplished. <laughs> so it's limited to the, the northern most, most section there. And there are a few trees still standing and that might be that could be piece. again they're not owned by the city right, they're within the city limits Lynn Reuter, whoever owns it yeah sure Commissioner Engelberger <clears throat> thank you also Rodney the uh, the platted area there that you talked about that's not in the city either that's that's a township plat also isn't it 
Yeah, what just houses are there. Yeah, just to clarify, what we understand is Eggleston's Woods are the platted lots um, adjacent to this roadway, and none of this is in the city limits either. All oh, that resides in the town of Dunkirk. Yet, yeah. ironically, the balance of the Grand Ute Farm on the other side was in the town of Rutland, but this rural area is in the town of Dunkirk. Commissioner <coughs> Hannah. Yeah, just have a conversation since we're looking at this. Um, I forget the name of the road, the city road that terminates there, and then the little branch there. Um, the the connection. <clears throat> is there a reason why they never were connected? Is that for traffic to for cut through on 51 or? There's an agreement between the town and the city that that's not intended to be connected. Um, the rural character of this, uh, if you've, and you may have been out there, uh, the curvilinear nature, the narrow roadway width, mm -hmm. uh, really wouldn't be very conducive to cut through traffic. Right. So I think it's been uh, fairly, fairly well understood, and there is an agreement that indicates we wouldn't make that connection at this point. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Uh, agenda number five is a request by Scott Scavlin, SDS Builders, for a general development plan amendment to approval to construct a deck addition and for an existing deck conversion to a screened porch at 815 Berry Street. Uh, this request is before you because it's part of a plan development. You can see in the um, graphic here there is a, a, a need or a desire to add on to the, the facility here to allow for a screen porch and an expansion of the deck. Uh, this is required in this zoning district to come before the Planning Commission and Council. Thank you. So I'll close the meeting and open a public hearing. Is there anyone wishing to speak at this public hearing? No. All right. I'll close the public hearing and reopen for the regular course of business. Discussion or a motion by our commissioners? Commissioner Barman. Uh, <clears throat> my question would be whether or not approving the screened in porch would create a, uh, I'll use the er, an earlier precedence in the sense that if they later decide that they want to make it a, like a sun porch and close it, I mean, does that <coughs> make it easier for them to do that? I know this, there's a lot of times screen and porches eventually become further enclosed and I don't know if necessarily the the intent was to have this be eventually part of an expansion of the unit yeah for for zoning purposes we really look at the footprint of the structure that includes the deck whether it's a three season porch or a, an actual addition onto the house it's considered part of the structure um, irrespective of you know, a full full three season or a, even an addition onto the house. So it does build, add to the building envelope, much uh, much like it would be necessary if they were just having an open air deck. Would okay. be, the same process would be undertaken here. And the setbacks would be the same whether it's open air deck versus an enclosed sunroom. That's correct. Okay. You set them as part of this district, the planned development district. I think what we've uh, we've encouraged others to do when they're bringing in this type of thing in the future to look at the building envelope a little bit um, more liberally. Mm -hmm. In other words, you might have a building footprint here, but plan in the planning process to anticipate an appropriate size deck so we all can consider that as part of that initial package instead of what we're seeing on occasion now. Makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Further comments or questions? Motion to approve. The motion second. by Ingleberger, second by Hannah. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries. Also look for a motion regarding the site plan approval. So moved. I'll second. Motion by Ingleberger and second by Hannah. Discussion, questions regarding the site plan? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. There's a request by Linda Baxter Page, Aero Eberly Architects, for design approval to replace the second story windows at the Chorus Public <coughs> House, 154 West Main Street. We have someone here that can give an enlighten us some more, but you've seen the package of materials here. Um, ironically, uh, Chapter 78.517 is the section that we're in conversations about going forward. So it, it'll allow you the opportunity to understand how 
the current ordinance um, plays a role in the review of this particular application. Um, maybe if you wanted to give us a presentation, that'd be great. Don't hold your breath, everyone. Just wait on mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Adrian Power, the architects. Thanks for inviting me today. Um, as Rodney Shield pointed out, uh, my hair is a representative of the property owner um, who's looking to replace the second story windows at 154 West Main Street. Um, and in conjunction with that, we have submitted a packet of materials and put together a construction plan that essentially um, replaces the existing windows on the second story as shown on the left hand side of your uh, screen to historically and physically um, identical on the right hand side. Uh, all operations and functionality will be mashed, including uh, the brick molding and the uh, trims. The color is being proposed as matched as best as possible. We took five paint samples off of those windows and got five different colors. <laughs> so we've landed somewhere in the center. Story, our full operable double hung windows on the flanking sides of those bows with fixed, um, extremely large fixed sashes. Um, these windows will operate up, down, operational, full, double hung. Um, we are proposing one modification to um, the materiality, that being the exterior material would be aluminum clad in lieu of painted wood. This um, exception is uh, being put forth for not only budgetary reasons, but also performance criteria. Um, we in initially invest investigated all wood construction of windows on the size and scale and operation, and it was almost a 3x multiplier for that, as well as the warranty um, and thermal properties of the aluminum clad far exceeds that which we would get from a wooden window of this type and size. We're also proposing, and what you actually are seeing is a true rendering image of those glass types being proposed of a very, very low E vision glass. So again, we would have a gas chamber in there that would help with performance, but it is a clear. Um, the performance criteria is listed in that packet that you received and it, um, there, there's, it's graded as no visual difference by the glass manufacturers from clear to this type of glazing. Um, any questions with regards to this? Yes, sir. Commissioner Byron. <clears throat> Two questions. Mm -hmm. One, was it looked, I, I assume that the condition of the windows, the current condition of the windows is the reason the property is looking <clears throat> at replacing them? That's correct. Were, was there ever an attempt to look at um, repair of the existing yes. windows in comparison to the cost? Of yes, the we've been at this for two years. <laughs> um, and actually there is so much significant rot of the, the wood that there's not enough to adhere replacement to. Okay. Um, we checked with someone that was at, would be trying to overclad what was there and we couldn't even have enough substrate for the cladding okay. to be placed on. Um, so the next logical step was looking at wood replacement um, and then the option with the cladding on that as well. Um, okay. we, we have full profiles cut. They're knifing the profiles to match. Um, the sash, sash sizes and trim sizes are within a sixteenth of an inch of the existing windows. Um, it's within the tolerance of how you can bend metal versus the wood. Uh, so, I'm very pleased with the way you've matched the design. So then, my last question is related to the the reflective qualities of the paint. I mean, mm -hmm. is this going to be pretty accurate to how it's going? It is a semi mat like you see there. Okay. So there is a bit of reflectance. The the paint, the original paint, <laughs> we assume was an oil based mm -hmm. paint that was on there, which would have been slightly more glossy. Mm -hmm. um, what we experienced with the red colors, the red base colors on aluminum, is that they, the oxidization and the interaction with air flattens the, the sheen to about what you're seeing there. So you kind of start with where you're ending anyways, right. so you don't notice that transition over time. Well, my preference would be for more of a flat, less shine. That's mm -hmm. one of the concerns with uh, aluminum clad is that sometimes they become so reflective. Right that they don't look like a wood window normally would look, but this, this. Yeah, it, we've worked really pretty. hard to try to get that. Yeah. Um, and thank you. yes, thank you. The owner of the building is very invested in making this the right move for Main Street as well. So. Excellent. Anything else? Very nice. Further questions or comments? I would entertain a motion. Motion I'll, approved. I'll second. Motion by Engelberger, second by Barman. Commissioner Engelberger. Thank you, Anna. And I got a question, not a question, just a comment. Mm -hmm. 
in my estimation, um, you know, this this is a, an area right here, to me, that would be better suited for landmarks to take a look at. I understand that it's not a local landmark, but, you know, while we're making this transition of, um, of our ordinances, or not our ordinances, but our, I guess it is our ordinances, when we're making our changes to those, you know, they have the expertise of what's required by the National Register and, and those types of things of products to use and those kinds of things. I just think that, you know, we don't, as a, as a planning commission, we don't have the expertise in a historical perspective. And I think that that's something we ought to look at. This would be a perfect example where I think that landmarks could do something like this and you know, even if it was a, have them just check it to make sure everything is good and then recommend an approval to us. I just think that's uh, an obvious place where it should be, but it's just my opinion. Okay, thank you. Other comments or questions? Seeing none, we do have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. There's a request by the City of Stoughton for a conditional use permit to allow a composting operation at 1101 <coughs> Collins Road. Um, you're familiar with the site. We've gone through the rezoning activities at the Planning Commission level. Um, this would facilitate the composting operation that the city would operate essentially behind the area that is currently shared with Dunkirk off of Collins Road. Um, this is a depiction of the anticipated layout and I, I think the packet also I think I know the packet also shows you another plan that shows you the orientation of the site a, a little better um, recognizing that the northern half or northern portion is where the facility is for the main buildings and then the composting areas the area to the south um, we are maintaining obviously the separations from wetlands and the like that is required by by the standards as well. Thank you, Rodney. So I'll close the meeting and open a public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on the public hearing regarding composting operation at 1101 Collins Road? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and reopen for further discussion. Motion approved. So second. motion by Ingleberger, second by Hannah. Discussion or comments? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Need a, a motion and discussion as well regarding site plan approval? Motion approved. Motion by Ingleberger. Second. Second by Bartlett. Comments or questions? Who did the design? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Who, who laid it out? Um, myself and Brett Abear have been working with our consultants at Veer Becker to, to lay it out. They've been... Um, dealing with the stormwater and the topography and issues related to that. So, it nice. looks like it should work well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. I thought maybe that was your handiwork, Ronnie. Nope, can't take credit. <laughs> <laughs> but I slept at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a request by Bill and Carly Miller for a certified survey map approval to adjust the side lot line at 904 and 920 Dunkirk Avenue. Um, this request comes before you because they're actually looking at adding on to this particular building. Um, you can see that the former lot line as drawn in this dashed line would have precluded them from meeting the setback requirements from that irregular shaped parcel. Um, they worked with the adjacent property owner to um, create a different parcel line. Um, the new one would be this location that will help them accomplish the setback requirements for their parcel. That's why it's before you. <clears throat> Very nice. Comments or questions? Commissioner? Did you get Bartlett. approval from both owners? Did you see that? I saw that in your comments. Something about needing a letter of approval from both owners? Let's get a letter. We do have it. Okay. today. Okay. There you go. Good. Thank you. I would hate to adjust something if the owner really didn't want that change. Yes. Wouldn't we? That wouldn't be appropriate. Um, additional comments, questions? Motion to approve. 
Second. Motion by Engelberger, second by Bartlett. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. We'd like to continue our discussion on the proposed ordinance amendments related to the request by the Common Council to develop an ordinance for consideration by the Council that would amend existing city ordinances such that no building in a historic district listed on the National Register of Historic Places may be demolished without review and recommendation by the Landmarks Commission and a decision by the Common Council based on appropriate and lawful standards. And first of all, thank you to Rodney and Michael for the work that they've been putting in on this for our discussion this evening. Um, I think it's I think it's important to highlight, even as this was being worked with the Landmarks Commission, not all the discussion is focused about the standards for demolition. <laughs> it, you know, it's evolved into the discussion about criteria and what guidelines or standards should be appropriate for what structures. Um, what Michael did here was something I think is, is pretty valuable in that he took and placed the code language of chapter 78517, which is non-landmark buildings but downtown design overlay district uh, regulations, are in red. And then what he attempted to do in the blue, he harvested out of the, gui the, the landmarks design guideline manual. The, the, kind of pertinent sections of that, for in this case, guidelines on horizontal bands. Um, and the reason I, th I think this proves to be quite valuable is, recall we were kind of struggling with how do we adopt essentially the guidelines into the standards and if that's all inclusive or what pages don't we include or what do we include. And I think it really is a, an opportunity and, and maybe um, very appropriate to see that there there isn't that much difference. I think there's some things that have to be tweaked, but it seems like if that's the intent is trying to capture the spirit of those guidelines specifically in the code, we might be able to do that just by amending 517 in these mm -hmm. applicable sections. And before we started going down that road, we wanted to have a conversation with the Planning Commission and um, discuss and flesh that out a little bit. Uh, the guidelines as we kind of interpreted them or read them many of the many of the statements within the document were really not geared towards requirements um, recommends and, 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 yeah so mm -hmm. it seemed um, whereas if, if you are in a position where you need to have things very clear uh, this might be a better avenue to do so um, not to say there isn't going to be some things we have to work through and tweak and really address on a case-by-case -case basis, but um, we thought this offered a real opportunity to see where the, the guidelines are quite similar to an existing ordinance we have already. I'm going to actually use an example of something that we might have to consider changing. Um, the application that we just had, had for the windows. Um, in 517, there's language that already says, and this may be good or bad, um, but under windows and doors in chapter 517, and I'll, I'll just read it so I don't, I don't have it up on the screen. For windows and doors, it says, dark frames, i.e. anodized bronze, shall be used to replace storefront and upper story windows. <laughs> That's what we saw. But it might not be what we, you know, as we talked, if there's a way to, because there's other language that talks about in general trying to preserve and reuse like materials. Mm -hmm. So e even within what we have codified, there seems to be um, some clarification that would be appropriate. And I, I'm, I'm not taking a position one way or the other. I'm just highlighting the fact that there's, there needs to be an opportunity to go through this and if the direction is that you're more inclined to change the code that we have and incorporate the guidelines into them as opposed to the reverse we'd shift and start going down that path uh, in a more um, concerted effort as I read through it I thought it made a lot of sense but comments from commissioners Commissioner Hannah thanks yeah um, 
I think this this does make a lot more sense. Um, we're not rewriting mm -hmm. everything, and, and as Michael had mentioned last meeting, is we you know we were kind of trying to interpret what we had to this brand new document, and you know Matt had mentioned, well, it's, I can do a red line if you want, but it's be really hard, and you know, it, I mean, this is this is what we have, and. I could see, <clears throat> so maybe kind of what you're proposing is to incorporate the blue section into the new ordinance. Is that that kind of the thought process and use this as the guideline? I know it's still, there's a section here that says refer to yeah. the design standards. <clears throat> um, We're not necessarily suggesting taking the blue language and just putting that in the code book as it mm -hmm. stands, but it's, it's capturing what this says and incorporate it into the red language mm -hmm. right. to get it consistent. Specific. To be specific, but not having the guideline language. Just We're just showing that there are so many similarities already. We might not have a whole lot of tweaking to do to the red sections to really accomplish what the guidelines were trying to, to have in place. Thank you, Commissioner Barman. Um, I, I like this a lot and, and, and reading through it I mean I actually could visualize actually just having um, and again I don't know what's possible from a code and ordinance perspective but I, I think having the reference to our language of the guideline directly and I went through and actually put the page number on because then someone could actually go through and look for more detail either as a property owner a developer or e us as commission members we can go back and look at by page number more detail that sets up some of those guidelines because as you read through some of the guidelines out of context there are, are some definitions that are missing like on what a what a bay is or what some of the other terminology is and and I think um, I wouldn't see a problem and again I don't know what your vision was um, certainly I think there's a potential to kind of merge the two but I think actually having almost boxed in areas that just have the guideline there as a reference that connects it to this would also be valuable. But I, I really like the way you've put them side by side. We'll have to explore what kind of code commentary we can have within the code. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the challenge, not challenge, we'll just have to make sure that we understand what that guide is. Is It's a reference document right. at that point as opposed to maybe the, the code document. The, we envision the code to be written in in the ordinance, but I I recognize the need to have some um, some visual guidance outside of that. Much like administrative codes with Wisconsin, some of them have code commentary sections. They're not the actual code and they're not enforceable, mm -hmm. but it uh, allows you to reference those and understand what the intent of the code language was at the same time. Thank you. Commissioner Bartlett. I, I'm in agreement with Commissioner Barman and Hannah about I, I think this is the good way. I like the approach. I think this is the way to go. Appreciate the work put into this. I think it takes away a lot of the vagueness rather than just referring to the guidelines, whether we had a lot of issues with, which were identified before in our last meeting. So I would support continuing down this path. So, right. Commissioner. Yeah, yeah two questions. Um, and maybe you haven't even got to this step, but um distinguishing between contributing and non um and you know to the district and how how is, is it applied over everything is it not um and then street frontage um compared to rear uh of the building we we haven't fleshed that out. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, there's areas that needs to that needs to be worked out. Um, I think it makes sense for us to have a list of properties somehow, mm -hmm. either referenced or explicitly <laughs> listed. These are properties that are considered contributing and required to meet these standards. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my initial thought. Um, I do think we have to be. Uh, we have to work out how to deal with the less public portions of buildings. And while I think the intent is very good to have 
alleys have some treatment. Mm -hmm. Not every alley has the same visibility as others in the district. So um, we're going to have to work through that one together, but we'll try to consider that more. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, as this probably applies more to contributing buildings, but I also don't think that the non-contributing buildings should just be free to, you know, go off, you know, the rails and start painting crazy colors and, you know, so I, I think there really is kind of a, a trick as far as um, how to approach both of them. Um, to keep the non-contributing ones still within the character, but not necessarily, you know, if, if a non-contributing building doesn't have horizontal bands, if they want to make an update, we're not requiring them to put in faux banding or right. actual banding into their building or change their roof height and, you know, things like that. But I still think there are some portions in here, maybe that you can dissect those that apply um, when necessary. Yep. Yeah, good idea. good idea. Further thoughts? Commissioner Engelberger. So I guess <clears throat> what, I mean, this isn't completed yet. You're looking at bringing it back to us. Absolutely. And, uh, what uh, time frame are you looking at? Or what, I mean, do you want to bring it back to us next time? So here's a, here's our recommendation. We're hoping to get there. I, I we're going to work on it. We want to get, if we were going down the wrong path, we didn't want to spend the time to do that. We thought this was a worthwhile effort to talk it through, um, but I think we we want to get in a position where we can work um, at a staff level and with the city attorney to bring back a draft that incorporates this, the guidelines into the, the ordinance. So last time we were looking at getting rid of one of the sections, was it 517 or? Yeah. And that's still the case or no? Oh, 913. 913 is a section that we... So that's not no, no longer the case. Just going to try to incorporate things into that? It's still the case. Yeah, it's still... 13, 913 would still go... Okay. But 517 is the one that gets Just reinforced that with... Put in some things from both areas. From the guidelines yeah. into the 517. One question I would have is... Um, we talked a little bit about it last time regarding maintenance. Yep. Um, and I don't know that we have much in our ordinances right now. I mean, can we address that at the same time here? Yep, and we'll, we're looking for some feedback about maintenance and repair. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so we're going to you know, try we, to we just, figure that we, out, we too. We can't allow, not only in the historic district, but anywhere in the city, we really shouldn't be allowing people to let their buildings deteriorate <laughs> to a point where... You know, they're they're no longer acceptable. Dilapidated. You know? Yeah. So I mean, I I believe we should have some kind of language that doesn't allow that to, that to happen. Yeah. One of our one of our discussions has been actually implementation of a maintenance code. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's other cities that have that, and we can take a look at some language. And there there is, and there's some national level language. Um, Truthfully, it comes down to administration and, and mm -hmm. having resources to be able to manage it and enforce it properly and you know equally. Mm -hmm. um, not that we're shying away from it, I'm just telling you there is uh, th it's mm -hmm. a, a it's large undertaking. So and you know, I, and I understand that, and sometimes it's hard for you know a, a municipality to go and tell somebody they got to do this or you got to do that, but. You know, we are a lawful society, and that's what you do in lawful societies, you know. You set guidelines and regulations, and people have to follow them. I, I, I re more recall a, a home here not too long ago. Raccoons were getting in the roof or someplace and getting inside the interior of the building, and, you know, neighbors were complaining and that kind of thing, you know. So, I mean, we just can't have, you know, buildings being run down to the point where all of a sudden you got a junkyard. You know. I don't think we're afraid to enforce them. What I'm raising is the the staff time necessary to, to be equivalent yeah. and fair about it. But it's just like our lawn thing. I mean, you, you know, we have standards there, and, and once in a while we have to, you know, have somebody go mow the lawn, and we charge them for it. 
you know. <laughs> what I'm hearing Rodney say is even with the lawn, we, we tend to enforce by complaint. Yeah. And it would be nice to get to that higher level of enforcement just by regulatory um, requirements. Hard to get there but due to a time constraint yeah. with well, the staff we, we currently have. We got have. the same thing with speeding and or any, any other Absolutely. enforcing any other laws. You know? Yep. Commissioner Hanna. Thanks. Yeah, I think, I mean, from, you know, even stepping back, it at least, it might cover us, um, you know, in, say, a, a lawful standpoint to say, well, we've given you notification. These are, this is, mm -hmm. you know, the ordinance. Um, you know, and maybe it is just, you know, I'd see you out, out and about, you know, for probably as much as you can be out and about and away from the desk, but just sending a letter, making them aware. We sent the letter, you refuse to do this. You know, it's just something to fall back on instead of saying, well, I don't see any way that you can make me do this or not. Mm -hmm. um, so in that, in that sense, it just gives us some protection um, and say, well, we have it. Um, so this is why um, on another topic maybe just a detailed topic in here um, I see a few red lines on item four where uh, like the location of existing and proposed drainage facilities and is strike through um, yeah in the downtown overlay district very little stormwater management mm -hmm. occur. I mean, we have to deal with downspouts, but it's not necessarily stormwater. Yeah, I think that uh, would, control. That on was site. kind of my that's, question. That's would be downspouts. So yeah, that one was actually in two different spots. Oh, so I think right. Yeah, that one was crossed out. And I think there's another one somewhere. Got it. Yeah, duplicative. The red line just stood out to me. <laughs> I didn't catch yeah. the other one. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> just just so you know, uh, I have I have indicated that a code enforcement officer might become necessary depending on how far we go with codes like this mm -hmm. um, because while well, you see us out and about <laughs> um, if if we could devote staff time you'd certainly have more enforcement actions mm -hmm. underway it's just very difficult Absolutely. to dedicate that time Commissioner Barman uh, <clears throat> I have one one question and then I've got my homework assignment yes, that's <laughs> so right. I, thought I could share that uh, but I was wondering if there's anything to, that would be useful for us to hear about the landmarks meeting that was on last Thursday I didn't know if there was if they touched on this as well and I was kind of curious what their response to this was yeah they're sending a recommendation to um, council just to see you know what their level of support is okay for this so. probably on the 27th I'm not sure if it's going to make it there. Um, At some point, soon. yeah, I'm still waiting for information. Okay. And then I was asked to look, or I volunteered. You did volunteer. <clears throat> I volunteered to look under um, Section Six B, uh, Item Two, which was on currently states the building or structure is not in good repair. It's the second rationale for allowing for demolition mm -hmm. and, and as I thought and looked at it, that in more detail I think this really ties into our conversation about the maintenance ordinance and mm -hmm. keeping buildings from being in disrepair um, and what I was uncomfortable initially and why I volunteered was this 85 percent of assessed value which um, in most cases that's pretty easy to hit and you, if you could almost use this on any building to say we should demolish it and so um, what I was leaning toward, and I guess I could continue to work on, is the idea of, one, having it based more on an appraised value and having it be um, not necessarily tied to the building or structure is not in good repair, but the building or structure is not in usable condition or not fit for occupancy. And then looking at, the at, as item II, the 2I, the second point, being the cost of bringing the building or structure into usable condition exceeds a certain percentage of the appraised value of the building with those improvements. It's like when I did my uh, the rehab at the gas station building and it was partly for financing. I had to pay for a commercial appraisal but the appraisal was on what the building was going to be once I completed the work. And so looking at the difference, and I could see where if you had a situation where just getting the building into usable condition was going to be way over 100% of that appraised value of what it would be worth once you're done, that to me is a little bit better argument than just saying, 
I'm going to repair it and the cost of repairing it is too expensive. Um, so that's kind of the direction I think makes more sense is to focus on occupancy and, and the ability to use the space and then have it be an appraised value um, based on completed work. That's sure, I, that. I, I think that, uh, thanks for all your work, Todd. Um, it kind of clears it up too because um, I think occupancy you can use standards mm -hmm. where repair could be well, maybe your vision right? right and you know so occupancy I, I think maybe where there's still a little gray area is you know well I want to use these materials compared to you know the low budget materials that could put me in occupancy mm -hmm. you know where someone's like well I really want to you know go all oak hardwood floor and this and that and you know and you could get away with maybe something you know different or matching or whatever that would be less cost um, but I like the direction of that because occupancy is something that you know by that Mr. Kittleson could look at and say well this is what you need to do go get some bids and bring them back yeah sure. uh, you're, you're exactly I had the same thoughts and the two th one of the reasons I wanted to go with an appraised value is that if people have different vision for where they could potentially take the building now you're actually having a, a professional who's evaluating what the value would be worth if you did that so if you want to go all oak for example instead of a cheaper material that's going to come into play appraised. in terms of the appraised value and then if it comes into um, something that's beyond uh, making it usable, for example, they say, well, in order to be, you can't just make this usable because then I can't use the space because it's not a functional in terms of economic, then, I, then you say, well, that defaults to item one, which item one is notwithstanding the condition of the building, there's no economically viable use. And so, you know, then you're able to cover both bases if they say, even if I just go and make this habitable and get occupancy status, I can't use it, then at least we'll cover that in item one. All right, thank you. Any additional comments? Oh, Commissioner Yeah, Hanna. thanks. Which maybe item one is a little little more gray too, as far as that, that determination. Uh, but uh, going on our conversation that we had last meeting, it looks like um, the, the if I recall last meeting the last uh, ordinance we were looking at only had three options for demo and now there's four so the fourth one was added in there if I'm if you that's what you're saying yeah mm -hmm. yes and it, it's actually numbered three but yes, that's the one that was three, added. right mm -hmm. related to number three I I don't know if it was is valuable or of use to actually have the word contributing structure because that's kind of what we're talking about there and the conversation we were having was whether the building is contributing or not contributing mm -hmm. which this language does not use that terminology and it might be by I mean it might have been a rationale why that was but I thought there might be some value in connecting that to language we're using in other places such as the contributing because that's really, in a lot of ways, referring to non-contributing buildings. Good idea. Um, Good thought. Mm -hmm. One other thought, just on item one, is I was thinking about two. Um, and again, I don't know how we do this, but when when you're evaluating, I know the question came up with who determines whether it's economically viable. And again, if someone is coming to the city with the proposal to demolish, then I, I would think it would make sense to, to have, or potentially, just like we would have the commercial appraisal in item two, is to say the determination of economic viability would be hiring someone to make that assessment, a, a qualified professional or consultant, either in economic development or whatever it might be, to be able to make that kind of assessment so that there is at least some documentation. So it's not just the owner saying, well, I don't think it's economically viable, and then myself on the commission saying well I think it is so to have actually someone else a consultant that and I know I've used that language in work that I've done in other communities with as it relates to historic preservation and demolition ordinances is the requirement of having a professional um, report it's like hiring a structural engineer for example 
What kind of a consultant would do that? Well, I, I'd have to put some research. I mean, a structural engineer is, is uh, an obvious one for other kinds of cases. For this one, I'd have to think about what category of consultant makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. So I just, right now, I just, I, I kind of pencil qualify consultant and they could find someone and make the case. Most consultants can probably put together some sort of case as to why they're qualified. Right. When we started this topic tonight, I, <coughs> I suggested that we've kind of strayed from some of the discussion about the, or, the request from the council. Part of the request was to consider how to address demolitions throughout the historic districts. Um, and the, the Landmarks Commission has has dealt with the landmark stuff, but how do we deal with or address the question the council's raised when we're talking about properties outside of the downtown design overlay district? Should we be taking a position and moving? And, and I'll give you an example. We've got people that have detached garages in some of these areas that are in the district um, that are desirous of having them removed and rebuilt and there's a moratorium on them and has been for some time now and we're trying to understand if that still needs to be embroiled in this whole review of the ordinance or if that should be asked and answered in some fashion and dealt with so that that is or isn't covered under this this process or this moratorium how's it addressed now well, the moratorium says right now you can't demolish, demo, demolish any building in any of the historic districts, whether they're contributing or not, um, based on the, the moratorium that's in place. If a building is not a local landmark and it's contributing, um, normally, prior to uh, the moratorium, there would be a 30-day documentation period that has to be gone through. Um, aside from the ones that are contributing, let's discuss the ones that aren't contributing that are in the district. Right now, or prior to moratorium, there wouldn't have been any documentation period or any um, delay. And so are we, are we burdening those properties kind of just in the wheel of progress here <laughs> and instead of trying to address that and figure out if that's appropriate to be considered or changed um, or not because right now um, I believe we have two different is it two Michael I think we I know of one did we there's a couple requests two, two yeah. that we've gotten in, in the last you know six months or so that have shown an interest in doing so and we can't address those because of the moratorium so I didn't know if the commissioners had any thoughts about how how we should maybe address that at an upcoming meeting. I, I mean, not tonight. We're not going to be taking a motion on it. But if you have any thoughts about it, we'd certainly like to understand that. So maybe that can get addressed outside of the scope of this total rewrite. Sure. Commissioner Hanna. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think you kind of, just from what you said, I think making the distinguish Distinguishing between contributing and non-contributing, uh, if it's a non-contributing building looking to rebuild, uh, as we're looking at in this ordinance, we're expecting them to build new to fit, you know, historical uh, guidelines. You know, it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect a non-contributing uh, residential unit to go construct a, a contributing garage. Yep. Um, yeah, I think you want to keep it in balance with the home. Uh, so I think that's the clear distinction. Um, and just making that, I mean, the moratorium's done at the council level, but uh, I think yep. that that could be a switch. If you're looking to preserve the history, then focus on the historical buildings. Um, you know, then someone who's kind of, kind of wrapped up in the whole thing that isn't contributing to any of it and just happens to fall within the district doesn't have to feel the burden of that um, that discussion because uh, I don't I mean from my perspective it's, it doesn't seem like that was the the intent to really capture the non-contributing structures um, it really is just the historical so and you probably know exactly what ordinance addresses the historical residential districts um, and if what the language is in there and how it applies to non and those that do contribute 
Yeah, we we will probably bring that back uh, separate, or you know, in a parallel right. conversation, right. so that at least that can be considered. Because if this takes longer, um, we're not trying to expedite these these permits. We're just trying to make sure we can understand if they are appropriate to be processed uh, or just captured in kind of the minutia right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Barman. I, I, I guess one of the things that occurs to me is that, you know, and I'm looking back at the original uh, Common Council um, request for all this review, it would seem to me it would make sense to separate the issue with respect to the, the residential historic districts and the downtown overlay district because I think yeah. there's they're two different animals and it, you have two different groups working on those efforts and to have both of them tied to the moratorium I mean if the Landmarks Commission finishes and they may be even cl a lot closer than us to finishing to me let them finish and uh, and lift the moratorium with respect to the residential neighborhoods while we finish this up yeah. um, because I think they are two separate kinds of issues even though they're both tied to a nationally registered historic district one is a local landmark district the other is an overlay district with different code that that's being have it having to be discussed and reviewed and I think the way we're handling demolition in both cases is completely different from, yep. from what I understand yep. mm -hmm. thank you Alderperson Engelberger thank you <clears throat> well I guess I would agree with that I mean um, Originally, we, I think we were intending that this thing would be resolved by this time uh, with the changes, and it's gotten a little more difficult because other things have come into play. You know, other, you start changing things, and then what about this, what about that? So, you know, it, it is taking some time, and uh, I, you know, I think maybe Rodney can bring back a, his recommendation on this, you and Michael. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so we can consider it again. But, uh, I, and I also, I think there is, it's, it is a little different between the overlay district and the residential districts with regard to demolition, isn't it? Isn't, isn't it two different animals? Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. We just wanted to highlight the, <clears throat> yeah. the issue, and we'll bring back some, some response to that. I think I have just one other question. Yeah. Um, as we're as we're talking about demolition, uh, on same section six item A, I, I notice in this current version that demolition is subject solely to approval by the common council now. <coughs> um, is that correct? Because it looks like I mean we used to have language here that it would go either to the landmarks commission or the planning commission yep. prior to the council. So in this particular version. It just goes right to council, but the we might be involved because we would have to be evaluating um, a um, plan for the replacement right. building. So we wouldn't be chiming in as a on commission. We wouldn't be chiming in on a demo at all. We would be chiming in on whether they fulfilled one of the, the other permit items. stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I think uh, City Attorney Dragney pointed out kind of the the challenge with that recommendation who, who has ultimate authority and then um, does a recommendation in, in some of the recent state law changes created that conundrum where what is what can be heard as part of the public hearing what testimony is really um, able to be evaluated um, and having one distinct body making the action um, you're right Planning Commission and or landmarks would have other approval uh, that would run parallel to that demolition request for the new site that would have to be evaluated. Is is the Landmarks um, Commission also looking at similar language in that sense that, or is the demolition approval still going to that body for the residential neighborhoods? Or is that going straight to council with them as well? That's only for local landmarks. Right. Okay. Yep. So for local landmarks, or the, the, the local historic districts? We don't have any local districts. It's just that's, that's correct. local oh, landmarks. I got you. Right. About 32. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other thoughts? Sure. I, I think that makes sense. 
We appreciate the input. Thank you. I think we have a plan. It's always good to have a plan. Additional input, Rodney, that you're looking no, for? No, we just we appreciate the conversation and we'll uh, try to continue to move it forward. Okay, so next is future agenda items. Um, this will come back, um, if not the next plan commission, the following. Um, as soon as we can. What else? Do um, we we're aware that Mr. Arnett is working on his urban service area um, amendment materials. Part of that process requires a resolution by the Common Council for submittal of that material to Capillary Regional Planning Commission. So once that material is available and we get a chance to review it, it'll be brought to the Planning Commission to get input on that application before it goes to the Council. Yeah, thanks, Rodney. That, and that's just the, the lift station you know, we talked about and doing that. Have you had any conversations with them on the other uh, plan that they proposed um, or he proposed? We, we've discussed items. Um, he watched the, the show um, while it was being aired. Um, but in addition to that, the urban service application outlines kind of the density that could be accommodated doesn't say that it would have to be I mean there was no I, there wasn't an endorsement of the, of the plan that was presented before certainly there was issues that were raised and he heard heard issues that were raised and is going to work on that as he moves through the process but at this point he's focusing on the application materials to amend the urban service area great yeah I think as you had mentioned in the, the plan development uh, deck edition the building envelope was very uh, uh, concerning with the residential lots. Um, so um, I just made some some dashes on uh, your current status of developments, and I know he's on there as well for that's the CARP C. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Anything on Chalet Court? Is that just kind of holding pattern, or we're we're not hearing anything at this point. Um, I haven't had any recent conversations, recent even uh, probably the last six months. I don't think we've had any conversations about that property. Yeah. So I don't know where that's sure. going. Sorry to jump back to Arnett. No, no problem. The, the remaining uh, plat on his development um, with the big retention pond and everything like that, is that waiting on this approval? Yes. Um, that's what he's waiting on? Needs to have the urban service area amended to to facilitate that the rest of the that development. Of that. Correct. Yep. All right. It should be a busy summer. You're hearing from Mr. Nelson on the old RDA, the gas station property. That uh, when construction will start on that. Um. <laughs> good question. A uh, good, good, fair question. Mm -hmm. We we understand that he's um, requesting the RDA to consider an extension on the offer. Um, so I don't know where the RDA is going to go with that. Um, yeah. So that's all I can report. I just don't know the calendar on that. They'll discuss that on Wednesday evening and have more information for us all then. Okay. Thanks. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Engelberger. Is there a second? Second. Second by Bartlett. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you. That's your last.